Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for July 11th, 2021, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. The thematic Old Testament reading is Amos 7, 7 through 15. The semi-continuous reading is 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 5 and 12b through 19. The Psalm 85, 8 through 13. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, so that's uh, we're out of 2 Corinthians, and uh, the gospel is Mark 6, 14 to 29. It's my sister's birthday on July 11. Happy birthday, Emily. Happy birthday, Emily. 7-11. We called her the 7-11 girl. 7-11, there's, you know, there's convenience stores. In so were there California Slurpees there. for every birthday? Slurpees and big gulps. Does she dance? Blue raspberry Slurpee is what I want for my birthday. Oh, gosh. Ugh. Does she dance, uh, Emily? Uh, no, she, uh, but she was a cheerleader and she okay. played the flute. So. But that doesn't have, so it's not, okay. So the connection but, between. No. Hey, guess what? There's a birthday story in the gospel. See? That was my connection. There oh, you go. Sorry. sorry to step on your connection there. I, uh, yeah, you, you beat me to it. See, and so her birthday, and then we go to a great birthday party. Actually, not so much. So last week we had uh, sending of the prophet Ezekiel, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, they will know that a prophet is among you. That's kind of what Herod has. He doesn't like, he doesn't like John, the prophet, because John said, uh, you shouldn't marry your brother's wife. But he knows he's a prophet, so he's kind of just keeping him in jail. And he kind of likes to listen to him. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is, well, this is. You can say this is one of the places where Mark steps out of its, you know, haunted, demon-filled filled world and shows us real politics at work, and that's partly mm -hmm. true. But, but I think it's also part of the apocalyptic story. Well, it's the same thing at the Passion narrative. Our, we, Jesus gets to Jerusalem, and there's no more talk of demons. There's no more talk of exorcisms. We have to ask, you know, where are the forces of death now embedded in the quote-unquote normal course of affairs? I think it's similar here that we need to see this as well. This isn't to try to excuse Herod, obviously, or anything like that. It's to say, this is what those death dealing forces look like in the context of, um, well, in this case, the politics of the day and the dangerous character of John's witness and Herod's own, um, it's the word I want, just arrogance and, and, foolishness well and the other aspect of this is the the fact that if we you know we talked about last week of the of the sending you know the sending of the disciples and that is that comes on the heels of of jesus rejection in nazareth or the questioning of jesus power in nazareth and it that larger theme of what what is going to be the response to uh, the, the prophet in your midst, uh, whether that be Jesus or the disciples who continue Jesus' mission. And so you have another one of Mark's famous insertions here that you have the mission of the 12 and then the recounting of death, the death of John the Baptist. And then 630, the apostles gathered around Jesus, the return uh, of the of the apostles and they gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And so it's, it's in the mid, you know, it's in the middle of the sending and the return that you have the story of, of the death of John the Baptist and, and you can't, that has to be taken into account as well. So I like to think about this story also as a story of honor and shame. Uh, the ancient world was a society of honor and shame. And so here's Herod. Um, he, he's going to choose to bestow an honor upon um, Herodias. But then she asks him publicly 
for something he doesn't want to give. So then he's put in a place of he either has to um, do what is shameful and not keep a promise that he's publicly made, or he has to do what is shameful and do what he knows is wrong. Uh, so one, I mean, just one point here is what happens when we honor the wrong people, when we, uh, and when we worry overly much about our own honor or shame. I mean, it's, uh, it seems to be one thing he does wrong is he, he chooses to, you know, bestow this gift of honor or this, you know, ask whatever you want and upon the wrong person at the wrong time. And so he ends up then um, caught on, uh, is he hoisted on his own petard? That's not quite the right metaphor, but he, he ends up in this position where he has backed himself into a corner and he doesn't have the moral courage to um, do the right thing. Yeah, and he chooses, he chooses, uh, he chooses the oath, but it's not only the oath, but it's the oath, you know, to Herodias, but he also chooses the oath, uh, going in the direction of the oath, fulfilling the oath, so he doesn't look bad in front of his subjects. Right. So <laughs> um, that's the, that's another level of this as well. That The great oath. thing, yeah. Yeah. The great thing about our politicians is they don't mind breaking promises. They, they do it. <laughs> all the time they promise things for elections if, and they don't care even the slightest if they do them mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. it's to their extremist based mm -hmm. base mm -hmm. I mean, yeah and there there are ways in which this is a, a, almost a common story right we're, we're beyond being shocked by this in so many ways it almost reads like a fable because it's become kind of a stock story but to remember, it is a revealing. I mean, I do think that the, the the concluding details about the head on the platter and then being offered from the daughter to the mother, there is a kind of don't miss what kind of monsters these people are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, John was arrested. Yeah, we probably knew when he got arrested, he was going to get killed. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that tyrants do, so on and so forth. But they're also monsters. There's something about that last detail, I think, that's, I don't, you know, you can get a little too gross to dwell on it for too long, but it's kind of like the scene in Revelation, right? Where you realize, you know, that Babylon's got this goblet and is drinking the blood of the saints out of it. You know what I mean? The thing that makes them look royal and powerful from the perspective of some, if you look at it close up and from the right angle, you see just how horrific it really is. Well, yeah, John the Baptist's head is the final dish in the birthday banquet. That's, you know, that's... Well, that's, now you're making me feel bad. That's just gross. Well, it is. I mean, it, it, that, <laughs> this is the setting, right? It's, it's this birthday banquet and the final, you know, the, the last course is his head on a platter. And so that gristliness in contrast to, you know, that gristly, horrific, monstrous detail in contrast to the poignancy, when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. That's the part I want to, I want you to talk about that detail. Me? Yeah. Oh, well, I, well, first of all, I would want to talk about it in contrast to that. You have this, the, this, mon this display of, of, you know, of horror, well, just, horribleness um is that a word and 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 the the extent to which power will go and that's you know the 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 horrificness of this and yet uh and yet this the the poignancy and of course you know we know that the details not lost that not even jesus disciples of course um bury jesus so there's that you know that's foreshadowing of jesus own death and burial but uh but that contrast between th that horrifying detail and and the and the poignancy and the passion and the compassion of 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 John's disciples ta taking his body and laying it in a tomb is um, and that that's uh, that their recognition of who John was is in contrast to John you know Herod realizes who John is but 
chooses a completely different path or a completely different way of of responding. So I, I don't know. That's I guess that's all I would say about that. But it's it's a remarkable juxtaposition, shall I say, <laughs> that should not be lost on the homiletical spirit. You know, uh, this is your chance to preach the book, Amos. This is your chance? Yeah, really? well, so it's summer. It's a good time, you know, to preach the book, Amos. It's, uh, yeah. and I think in, in situations like this, for people who use the thematic Old Testament uh, reading, when, it, when you get to a book that uh, doesn't get very much attention, but deserves it, uh, this is a time you kind of, you kind of get to preach the whole book you know, in one sermon. And it's a time to bring in some visuals. So there's a series starting in uh, chapter seven, one in Amos, there's a series of uh, visions that Amos has, which then he, God shows him a vision of destruction and judgment covenant coming and he prays to God uh, don't let it happen. So the pros the prophet here is an intercessor uh, rather than just a messenger. So the first one is a storm of locust. Don't bring in a storm of living locust, but you might, you know, bring in something to represent them. Uh, and then he, uh, Amos intercedes for the people and God says, it shall not come. Then there's a shower of fire. Uh, then the third one, this, this is actually the third vision. Amos 7 is of, of the Lord standing beside a wall built. And of course, unfortunately, we don't know what the word means. It, it, it happens he, three times here, plumb line in verses 7, 8, uh, and, uh, 7 and twice in verse 8. It's the only three times this verse happens in the Bible. Traditionally translated as plumb line, it's clearly some sort of building device meant to build a wall straight. Um, the point being, the, the people are not upright. So just go ahead and go to the hardware store and buy a plumb line. And, or, or go to your construction guy in the church or gal who uh, builds. And you know, the idea is, are you measuring up? Mm -hmm. And then this time, uh, then they, uh, what's, what's your little word? Intercalation, in, interpolation? Caroline, because uh, that's what the editor intercalation. of intercalation. Yeah. So that's what the editor of Amos does. In between the third and fourth of these visions, he puts this story that explains why um, God um, doesn't relent after this to this one, because uh, the priest comes to the prophet and says, uh, "We don't, we we don't want to hear the word of God. Go home." go back to being a, uh, a farmer. We don't want to hear uh, your preaching. I do also want to say that sometimes uh, certain Old Testament scholars say that because Amos says, I am a herdsman and dresser of sycamore trees, they say he's poor and uneducated. That's not necessarily true. He might have been the one who owns the flock and owns the vineyard. And uh, so don't assume he's poor because he uh, was a farmer, the, the land was the greatest form of wealth. And then in chapter eight comes the last, uh, the last of the visions. It's the image of a summer, a basket of summer fruit and the word um, basically north, south difference. Anyway, uh, the judgment that will come, the announcement that judgment would come. I just think it's a time to have fun. You could bring in a basket of fruit and then explain that the word fruit actually Kate's kites sounded different in the north and the south. Amos is making fun of their accent that the way they say fruit is the word that actually means end. And, and he's saying, you're right. The mm. end is coming. Mm. Have fun. I'm I find sure it usually I... goes well for me when I make fun of people's accents. That always turns out well. <laughs> well, as somebody who has a funny accent myself, I don't mind being made fun of. Yeah, this could be kind of a, you know, a day in the life of the prophet. This could help get people excited to take up the prophetic mantle. I, I like still, what you did I, there. I think I'm still leaning toward the final course and the birthday banquet, but 
But that was a good. That was that was very it was very convincing, Rolf. I appreciate it. So what about it's, uh, that? It's never been it's never been easy to be a prophet, right? I mean, it's just to yeah. kind of no to unpack that for people. Yeah. Yeah, it's never been easy for Amaziah either. When you're explain too, when, when you're a priest, you know the last thing you want is a prophet to show up. <laughs> We want to bring in Psalm 85 in some way here before we move to the second, uh, the semi-continuous reading. Is there anything you would, or anything? It's so beautiful, but I don't know how it, I don't know how I'd connect it. Beyond, I know. Just in love itself. It's some of the greatest poetry in the Psalms, I think. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I would use it, guess. How? Uh, in the bulletin? Yeah, liturgically. In the announcement? Oh, liturgically. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, first of all, John August Swanson, uh, who, who is an artist, has a great painting of Psalm 85, mm. uh, that pe especially this part of Psalm 85 that people might want to see. Just uh, You've got these great images of steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness and peace will kiss faithfulness will spring up from the ground righteousness look down from the sky and he has imagined this in in a wonderful painting which ties in uh both his uh i think his mother was mexican um and his father was swedish or something so he's got some of this the, the mexican imagery in the painting anyway uh you can find that on the internet it it is filled i think with just lovely uh images of in some ways things that are are these qualities of god right steadfast love faithfulness righteousness peace they are anthropomorphized as messengers then that um go ahead of god uh and manifest themselves in the goodness of creation the lord will give us what is good Mm -hmm. uh, righteousness will go before him. There's the messengers and make a path for his steps. Maybe not messengers. Maybe it's more like um, royal servants that 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 the, that the divine qualities actually are God. Really, I think is more to the point. All right, and the alternate first reading. We've I got... love this story. I. Why do you like this story? I, I love I, the verses they skip. Yes, uh, talk about that for a minute, Matt. Well, it's summertime. It's, you know, things are fun, be light. It might be a good time to talk about Uzzah and the guy who wants to make sure that the ark doesn't slip off the cart. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have, I would have every bring, everybody bring their personal recipe of raisin cakes. I'm just kidding. That's I'm just pointing do. out that sometimes the lectionary delivers us from the hard parts uh, yeah where Uza well, dies i think everybody should bring their favorite raisin cake recipe that's i don't think a lot of people have favorite raisin cake recipes but their sour cream raisin pie that's i believe hosea popular. hosea rails against people who eat the sacred raisin cake <laughs> that, that's true by the way <laughs> Rolf, ralph's dying to talk about this story <laughs> no it's true that Jose, hosea does he doesn't like the raisin cake because they're offering it to baal Ah, Never uh, can't, no more, no raisin cakes. Well, I do, I do think people, this would be a great, uh, but also then uh, uh, a portion of meat. Yes, bring your favorite uh, portion of meat and raisin cake and meat in the church parking lot. So David has recently conquered Jerusalem, which up to this point was not uh, an Israelite city. And last week, what, where he was then also anointed by the Northern tribes, and so now he moves to unify the people. He moves the capital to Jerusalem. And I think this is the, the theological point of the story. He puts, having made a new capital, he puts God at the center of the, of the city and therefore God at the center of the people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's what our con every congregation should be doing that. Every congregation... Mm -hmm should be putting God at the center of their communal life. And what does that mean? But it's not safe to do so, um, which is why uh, the, the part where the guy reaches out and touches the ark, bam, and gets zapped, 
that's that's symbolic of it. It's not necessarily safe to put God at our center mm -hmm. because this God is a holy God, a uh, one who can't be bought off with bribes or manipulated. And so uh, just a reminder that with God, there is power and God's power uh, is not necessarily safe, at least not safe for our ways uh, that, of living. So I, so I think that uh, I, I agree, Matt, they uh, restore the uncomfortable versions and, uh, excuse me, verses, not versions, restore those. And um, I think that it's, this is a fantastic text that speaks to today. Well, and maybe, yeah, dangerous, you recognize dangerous, but that you never, you never really take for granted God's power. Or once, if you think that you've got God's power in your back pocket, or if you think you can have any kind of control over it, uh, that, that, that's what this, that we keep God at the center. I think that's important, but we never forget the other side of the story is we never forget what that what that power means and do we really hold it in the kind of fear and awe or do we take it for ourselves do we control it do we try to box it in um i mean i can never read this story without thinking of that last scene of Raiders of the lost ark where they're like <laughs> don't look marianne don't look you know and faces are melting and heads are exploding and because they do not realize that the what the power of god means and uh so, but it's also beautiful. It's also beautiful. So the guy says, right? It's beautiful I know. Before it's beautiful. The, before his face starts melting. Let's love that part. But Indiana Jones knows. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. And uh, and they don't. And they're spared. So I think that I I I, I think that'd be a great sermon. Plus, and you add the raisin cakes in there, and yeah, be a fun Sunday. I think you could have fun with this sermon. Maybe fun's the wrong word, but at least explain that there's a lot of ways to read this, right? David's obviously unifying, trying to unify a, a fragmented kingdom, obviously a very young kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that with geography, he's doing that with politics, he's doing that now with religion as well. And to and to point out, some people see the shrewdness of this, some people see the piety of this, some interpreters see this more cynically as a kind of, uh, of, of yoking. See what I did there? Yoking. Um, politics and religion, if I can use those terms, which you know were already deeply yoked anyway in the ancient world. And this time I talk about that because it brings up questions, of course, how we imagine religion is part of our public life, right? And what the church's role is in that and the ways in which there is a piety about putting God in the center of our common life. There's also obviously a desire to manipulate that um, and to make kind of unholy alliances to, to secure that or our own interests. And just to name that it's always dangerous, however you do this. Um, and just to, to kind of talk about power, how power works. I don't know if it's a sermon that would ever explain anything or come to some clear answers, but at least would give people some new language and imagery and a story to continue those conversations around. I like that. I mean, mm. David's going to find out in just a few chapters what it, uh, how dangerous it is to put the word of God at the center when he sins and then God, who, whom he has invited into the center of the city, uh, speaks through Nathan and challenges him. I mean, uh, Herod is experiencing this with the prophet who calls, calls him forth. So you've got, you know, you don't need to go outside of the Bible for your sermon illustrations about why is it dangerous to put God in front? Because God, uh, this is a holy God. Mm -hmm. uh, and God says, as I am holy, you must be holy. And uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do that. Well, the alternative is a life without God because uh, it's not a buyer's market. By the way, we do have to also point out we got dancing in the first lesson and in the semi-continuous Old Testament lesson. There's so, the connection. Dancing. There is uh, because but, but because this is the semi-continuous uh, pathway, uh, it's not chosen as a thematic. Oh, because there's dancing in the gospel, you have to have dancing. Right. I know. But it is still there. And I didn't look to see what the psalm is that goes, uh, 
with uh, the semi-continuous, but they ought to have one that praise God with dancing, you know, Psalm 150 or something. Dancing, dancing. I like dancing. Lord of the dance, here we go. I, I never get to go dancing though. Um, Ephesians 1. Okay, Ephesians. So I wonder how we many weeks we're going to be in Ephesians. Seven. Seven well, weeks. And well, I, uh, I should choose Ephesians now. And I got my next seven weeks all figured out, you're saying. You, uh, you, you do. Uh, so I don't have to worry about the gospel text coming up in the next couple of weeks. Oh, ouch. That hurt. Uh, yeah, so you've got Ephesians for seven weeks. So if you choose to go this way uh, to avoid the bread of life discourse in the gospel of John. Or just because maybe you think that <laughs> Ephesians might have something to say to your community. <laughs> okay, maybe. Uh Here's the thing. So a couple of things. First of all, uh, I always think it's fascinating that Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is all one sentence in Greek. I, you know, I think we point that out every single time, but I, you know, that, that, but that, that rhetorical aspect of this verse, I mean, how you can read, there's a way you can, um, change the punctuation or read it in such a way, because I think that, that rhetorical reality is a clue to one of the themes in Ephesians, which is the cosmic scope of what the author is trying to get at in terms of the, of the meaning of, of, of what God has revealed in Jesus Christ. And so you have this reference in heavenly places uh, in verse three, and then in verse 10, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So that's a major theme. And so that, you know, that, that, that this is the cosmic scope of, of what God is up to in Jesus. It's not this individualized, no, is it, you know, congregationally or communally based. So that's one theme. The other thing I'm going to say, and I uh, say this also every year, but I'll say it again, is that if you are going to commit to Ephesians, you, I think the preacher must commit to addressing 5, 21 to 32, which is eliminated, omitted in the uh, lectionary, but wives submit to your husbands. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot skip over that uh, because it's our responsibility uh, as preachers to sometimes to provide correctives for how certain texts get used to, uh, to oppress. Uh, in this case, particularly the historically to oppress women. So uh, if you're going to go this route, you can't skip over that. You're going to have to say, okay, okay, people hear us. We're going, we are going to talk about a passage that has a dreadful history uh, to justify oppression of women. So that's it. That's all I have to say this time. Well, and maybe maybe you start to set that up that, that instead of just saying, okay, somewhere I have to find a way to replace those verses from chapter five oh. to make those fit my calendar. Maybe you set that up by already preaching Ephesians one and saying, the author has yeah. opened the treasure vault here of all of the amazing things that God does for us. So a letter that's so generous, so effusive now, I mean, it's just yeah, just yeah. a point ahead. This is a letter that down the road we're going to see has also been used in some horrific ways or has been or that seems to fall back on hierarchy or seems to fall back on other ways of ordering the world that might be at odds with this. You know what I mean? So that yeah, you're not just yeah. figuring out how am I going to do that one sermon down the road, but. No, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to have it on the horizon right away. Yeah. This is just an avalanche of gifts that come yeah. in, in chapter one. And so that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just to, just to start, you know, um, checking off. Here's what God gives you in Jesus, blessing, election, mm -hmm. adoption, redemption, forgiveness, inheritance. You know, um, Matt, a, a couple months ago, you talked about the inheritance fantasies that uh, are written up. I think maybe you could just close the podcast by saying a little bit about that, because I thought uh, that was such a helpful thing that I didn't know. My own personal inheritance fantasies? No, in the ancient world. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. That's a different podcast. Uh, the, well, the source for this is Sarah Rudin, Paul Among the People. Rudin is R-U-D-E-N. 
talks about adoption and she comes at it through the way that Greek literature, a common trope in a lot of like popular fiction was people um, imagining that they might actually get adopted by some famous rich person. You know, it was kind of the, it was kind of the let's win the lottery kind of story of, uh, of the ancient world because adoption usually meant uh, incredible riches, incredible security. It's, it, it was this, you know, you are set. I, all of your worries go away. And so this notion of, of inheritance um, being tied to adoption. And you mentioned earlier, honor and shame, right? All the honor of the benefactor accruing to you and the benefactor's family accruing to you. And so when God is in the role of the adopter, or the one who gives the inheritance, that this is in some ways not necessarily playing on that exact trope or that motif, but that same kind of thing. Like, could you imagine being adopted by a senator, like some really you know wealthy noble person? What about to be adopted by God into God's own family? That that's the that's the astounding part. That's the part where everybody would be, oh come on, you know you got to be kidding me. That seems over the top. Uh, but that's the that's the statement in Ephesians one. It's also, of course, uh, really big in in Galatians four and um, in other places too.